This is now uh, tilted. And when, when you do this for, for niobium, you find this type 2, 1 behavior. Now Mozhakov calls it type 1.5. Okay, it's just a different name. <laughs> then what is this will jump here to from when you increase the applied field from a small distance, uh, a large, from infinite distance to finite distance. But you, you cannot observe this state when you have a long cylinder. But when you have a sphere, this vertical curve is now tilted, and you can apply a magnetic field anywhere in this interval, and then you will see this cluster structure, which I showed before. So you can, uh, you can choose any induction by choosing an appropriate applied field. And this is this so-called type 2-1 uh, behavior. And the type 2-2 two, two behavior is a classical up-recursive behavior. So when you have a sphere, the, uh, this magnetization curve is just sheared a little bit, but qualitatively looks the same. Um, then I, at that time I continued, I calculated the magnetic fields and the order parameter, the psi squared, this is a Ginzburg-Landau function, for single vortex for three different kappa values. An interesting point is that in the center of the vortex, uh, the magnetic field is just two times. You see here two. It's two times the lower critical field. This is an interesting effect. This follows already from London theory, and it applies when kappa is not too small. Kappa equal to two is already a large kappa, because the, met the quantity which matters is 2 kappa squared. And so this is a large kappa behavior of a single vortex. And then you have vortex, uh, vortex light is a periodic one. Then here at two different uh, densities. So here some field B0 of induction, and then four times this induction, or just half the vortex spacing. Then you see the order parameter is periodic and also the magnetic field is periodic. Here, at low inductions, the magnetic field is a linear superposition of such single vortex fields, but at higher inductions, you see the magnetic field is almost constant and has a, only a small modulation because the vortex fields overlap. This here, these contours, they can be interpreted in three ways. They are the streamlines of both the order parameter, psi squared, and also of the magnetic field. And they are, at the same time, the, the streamlines, the, the current, the they give the direction and density of the uh, flowing supercurrent, which circles around vortices. And then I calculated magnetization curves for all inductions, uh, for, for, for all inductions, and for, or for all applied fields, and for all kappa parameters, so from 1 over square root of 2 up to very large values. And also, I calculated the shear modulus. The shear modulus is very important, the shear stiffness of the vortex lattice, because it enters so-called uh, series of the random, of summation of random pinning forces, which determines the critical current density. So you see when kappa is 1 over square root of 2 here, then the shear modulus is exactly zero. And when kappa increases, shear modulus goes to some saturation value, which is reached when kappa is large or, or equal to 30. And at zero induction and at BC2, it also vanishes. Though in three cases, the shear modulus is small or zero here. And for this value of kappa and also here, these are general results. This is the numerical solution of a vortex, of, of, for a vortex like this in a, in a film. This is a superconducting <coughs> film, the surface, and here is the, the superconductor, and this is a vacuum. And when you do the calculation uh, for periodic lattice, you see that the magnetic field lines, they widen, they mushroom. First, inside they are parallel and compact, and then near the surface they become wider. This is an approximate solution. This solution just shows if you use the two-dimensional Aprikosov uh, uh, solution or the numerical solution and fit a stray field, it would look like this. But in reality, this is, of course, uh, not physical, this sharp bend. In reality, these are smooth, uh, smooth magnetic field lines, which I also obtained from, 
from these numerical calculations. These are the profiles of the magnetic field and of the order parameter along the, here at the middle line and also along the surface. At the surface, the magnetic field has smaller amplitude, but the order parameter uh, profile is practically, this, this is the order parameter profile, which goes to zero here. It's the same. You see that the solid and dashed curves are the same, whether you look at the order parameter in the middle or at the surface. It doesn't matter. It's, the difference is just about 1%. This is a similar calculation, but it's analytical. It's from London theory, the situation when you have one single vortex. And now when you superimpose periodically many such vortices, you get uh, the same picture. But this is a, an analytic solution, which I once obtained with Gilson Carneiro from Rio de Janeiro. This is some, the same solution, but for th different thicknesses, thick film, thinner, thinner, and even thinner. Here, some analytic calculation. The, the behavior of a single vortex in a thin film, so-called pearl vortex, so, because you, they are pearl in 64, wrote his thesis and calculated the properties of such a vortex in a thin film. Thin means thickness should be smaller than the penetration depth, depth lambda. You, you, you see here, here is this little vortex, and you have a, a thin film, and now the magnetic field lines above and below the film have to be parallel to the film. Also, you know, there's a, uh, it's like a magnetic monopole. You have radial magnetic field lines. Therefore, you know exactly the magnetic field along this line goes just like 1 over uh, r squared. It's just the, the flux of this vortex is distributed equally in the half space here. Because of the half space, there is a factor uh, well, here you see it here. There's not 4 pi, but 2 pi. So flux phi 0, the quantum of flux, I forgot to say, Aprikosov discovered that these vortices have uh, a quantized magnetic flux, phi 0. And phi 0 divided by 4 pi r would be the flux, uh, the magnetic field of a monopole, which has a circular, symmetric, or spherical a field, but here you have the field only in the half space, therefore it's 2 pi. And then it decays like 1 over r, the three-dimensional r to the third. And this means the jump of the magnetic field across the film, this jump gives you just the current density, uh, has this shape, so you can just write it down. And the, the energy of a second vortex, which sits, for instance, here, is just the current density, this current density times the flux quantum. And therefore, the potential, the interaction potential, uh, can be calculated from this force. This force should be minus the first derivative of an interaction potential, and this is the interaction potential. So you can just write, write this down without real calculation. And this is for ideal superconducting film, when the film has a finite London penetration depth. So here, the London penetration depth is assumed to be zero. When it's finite, then you need a so-called two-dimensional London. This is a London penetration depth, lambda. But lambda squared over thickness of the film is a two-dimensional uh, magnetic penetration depth, lambda. And this enters the correct solution. This is a co solution for the general case when you have a finite uh, penetration depth. You can write it in this way or in this way. This is a, a general expression. And this has been solved by... Judea Pearl in, 2000, uh, in 1964, and he presented this in form of two complicated uh, uh, Bessel functions, a Strobe function and, and another function, and then you have to integrate. But a much simpler expression I found by chance, you can approximate, this, this is a numerical result of the integral, uh, just integration in case space, and also, if you would tabulate these analytic functions of, of Perl, you would get the same. And here is a, an approximate expression, just a logarithm, and it contains, it, it reduces not only to the correct limiting cases, but it's everywhere a very good approximation. So this, this is the, the analytic approximation, is the Stutz 
and the exact potential is the red curve. So they, they coincide. Now, if you have a real film which has ends, say, for instance, a quadratic thin film, and for instance, also with a slit and with a hole, uh, I can calculate all this, and then the interaction between a vortex here, say, anywhere, and a pair of vortices. I need a pair because my solution is symmetric. <laughs> so this saves me a factor of eight in computation time. So interaction of one vortex with this pair is uh, drawn here. There is a logarithmic singularity, which is the same which was obtained by a pearl in 66. And then the potential is zero in this hole, of course. In the hole, there is no vortex or there is no vortex position defined. And it's also zero along the edges of the film. And in between, it, it increases. And now, when you compare the pearl potential, interaction potential between two vortices in the thin film and the numerical exact one, uh, for instance, for a square film. So assume you have one vortex in the center and then another vortex somewhere, and its interaction is calculated, and then you divide it by the Perl interaction. Then you should get unity if both solutions were the same. But unity you have only in the middle, so the, this logarithmic singularity is the same in, in numerics and in, in Perl analytic solution for the infinite film. But when you go away from the middle, then you see the exact solution deviates very strongly from unity, and it goes as it has to be, it goes to zero at the edges because a vortex uh, at the edge has vanishing current. The, the current vanish, vanishes gradually when the vortex approaches, approaches the, ex, uh, the edge and then when it goes out, it's, it is dead. It doesn't exist anymore. So this interaction potential vanishes here. It vanishes linearly if you have a finite penetration depth and it vanishes like a square root uh, square root of the distance to the edge when you have uh, zero penetration depth. In the ideal screening case, you have you have a, a square root, a behavior like like a sphere here with vertical uh, with vert vertical tangent. Now, pinning of flux lines. Uh, pinning means that the position that the energy of a vortex depends on position. And it can depend of, on position because the superconductor may contain uh, precipitates or point defects, dislocations, grain boundaries, any structural defects. Or in, in yttrium barium copper oxide, even the twin boundaries on, and even the, the copper oxide layer. So even in a perfect uh, crystal, there is pinning by these uh, copper oxide layers which have quite large distance and by oxygen vacancies. So m there are many reasons for pinning and there are experiments which measure the critical current density which is called J sub C which is just the maximum loss free current density a, a superconductor can carry. Then the irreversible magnetization curves can be measured and the AC resistivity and susceptibility and of course also the surface resistance in your cavities. And in theory, our interesting problems is summation of random pinning forces. This is a problem which has been around for 40 years. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and it yields the maximum volume pinning force, which is just this critical current density times the induction. This is a force density, Lorentz force density. Thermally activated the pinning can be calculated because the pins have finite binding energy and there is also temperature. So this energy divided by KT enters some Ar Arrhenius law and this can lead to vortex motion even, even when you have a uh, F pinning. And then also the electromagnetic response uh, in general sense so also surface resistance should be calculated. And one important um, result of, of vortex pinning is that now the magnetization curves are strongly irreversible. So you can have very large irreversible magnetic moment and therefore levitation works now very well. First because the magnetic moment is larger, it's much larger than in the, in the Meissner state, but also 
because now you have stable levitation. Look, when you have a type 1 superconductor, it levitates, but it's not stable. It will fall on the floor.